Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and get this recorded and welcome everyone um, to our latest wellness webinar. We appreciate you being here. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Greg Turdell. He is our sleep specialist and we'll be talking all about stress and sleep and how that impacts us, especially I think during this stressful time. Um, I just wanted to give you a reminder that you have um, both, you have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, or a chat box, whatever's easiest. Feel free to ask questions throughout his presentation and I will help ask those questions on your behalf at the very end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Turdell. Thanks so much. Thank you, Natasha, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for joining. Um, I've, I've been giving these talks for the past several years, a variety of uh, sleep subjects. Uh, this is the first one I'm doing as a webinar, and actually this is my first ever webinar, so it will be both my, my best and my worst performance ever. So um, thanks again for joining. Um, as Natasha mentioned, I am the medical director of the Sleep Lab at Barton, and um, tonight we're going to talk about insomnia, and I'm, I'm trying to expand the focus a little bit. So I'd like to talk a little bit about you know what sleep is, why we need it, what happens when we don't have it, what normal sleep looks like, what things get in the way of normal sleep and ways we can address it. And at the end, I'll also touch base a little bit on, um, on sleep apnea. This is pretty much what we uh, use the sleep lab for is to diagnose and manage our sleep apnea patients, which by the way, can be a very uh, common, important cause and even overlooked cause of insomnia. So moving forward, this is a quote from uh, a very intelligent man, Thomas Edison. Uh, he is credited with the the light bulb and numerous other inventions that have changed all of life, all of our lives. Um, unfortunately, I don't think he had a very good grasp of the importance of a very important physiologic function known as sleep. And I'll show you why. So why is it important? Um, you know, it's interesting that even in modern times, we really don't understand why we need sleep. Um, we certainly know what happens during sleep. It essentially restores us physiologically, emotionally, and mentally. It's very important for consolidation of memories, organization, organization of ideas. Um, it's also kind of a, a spring cleaning we get every night. The, the brain reorganizes itself. It gets rid of things it doesn't really need. It puts important things into important places. And uh, even more important is what happens if we don't get enough sleep? And you can see this slide here there's numerous things. Um, and this is not enough sleep that's either related to insomnia from a variety of conditions, or it also can be uh, intentional sleep deprivation. So sleep is an easy place to get more time. It's like you got this to do, that to do, busy day, busy tomorrow. Um, we can get an extra hour or two if we sleep an extra hour or two. And that has the same consequences, the in intentional sleep deprivation that, that many of us experience. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a epidemic of obesity in this country right now. And one of the many factors contributing to that, again, is the national lack of sleep. On average, Americans are sleeping a little over six hours a night. You'll see a little later how much we actually need. One of the things that that does is there's this little gland in the middle of our brain that uh, secretes a hormone that essentially makes us hungry. And it's activated if we don't sleep enough. And you may find that if you are sleep deprived, instead of wanting to go out and get a kale salad and a smoothie, you're suddenly craving, you know, bacon and eggs, um, fatty, high calorie foods. And that's, that's actually a hormonal response. It's not just a personal failing. Uh, the, the other interesting thing that happens is when you're tired and you're sleep deprived and your body's trying to conserve energy, your metabolism will slow down, which again can lead to weight gain and difficulty with that. So if you are struggling with weight, you know, one of the places to look is certainly how you're doing with your sleep. And again, all these things can happen as a consequence, and without it, we can get sick, fat, and stupid. So how much sleep do we need? Uh, you know, it varies across the spectrum of our lives. Uh, anybody who's ever had a baby knows that they seem to sleep all the time, um, which is what they, exactly what they need. Their brains are developing, organizing, and that's an important part of it. Uh, interestingly, babies spend about 50% of their time, 5-0% in REM sleep, whereas adults typically 15 to 20. And if you look at this list, you can see uh, from newborn up to teenage years, we need less and less and less. And a couple of things worth uh, mentioning that are actually quite important. One 
is your teenager is not lazy because they want to sleep 10 hours a day. Um, this is what they need. The other thing that's happening is we're forcing teens into our adult sleep schedules. You know, we get up at six, we get going, we do things, uh, got to get out, got to get to school. Uh, for kids, that's about two hour shift. And so getting them up at six is like getting you up at four. And that's why it's often very difficult to rouse teenagers early in the morning. And it's also difficult to get them to go to bed when you think they should, because again, they have to get up early. Their, their rhythms are just different. And it's an important thing to recognize um, some sleep or some uh, school districts rather have uh, experimented with later start times. And uh, the studies that have been done show that the students do much better uh, satisfaction with the, the students, with the teachers, academic performance, everything's better, of course, except for the parents because they have to work around those schedules. Um, as you can see at the bottom, adults need between seven and nine hours a day. Seven is really the bare minimum. Uh, you'll hear people all the time saying, oh, I only need five hours of sleep, I'm fine. Well, we can get by with that, but again, for optimal function and to avoid all those things that you saw in the previous slide, we really need to be between seven and nine hours. Um, this was uh, ascertained at a, at a big conference uh, several years ago in Madrid, where previously doctors, we had told patients, well, how much sleep do I need? Well, you need between seven and nine hours. And we really never consolidated the science. We just think, well, that's what I need. So that's what must be what you need. So they all went to Madrid and they spent four or five days there and did a big consensus conference. And then they came out with this, uh, this uh, paper that uh, pretty much confirmed what we thought. So hopefully they had a nice, nice time in Madrid. So what does normal sleep look like? This is, this is very idealized. Uh, most people's sleep patterns would not look like this if you looked at it in a sleep lab or other ways of doing it. Many people now have watches and Fitbits and things that look at sleep stages. They're probably okay, but I certainly wouldn't hang your hat on them. When we determine these values in the sleep lab, we use a lot of monitors and a variety of parameters, including brain waves and eye movement, et cetera. So we go from light sleep, which is stage one, down to deep sleep, which is stage four, and then we periodically have REM. And one of the things you'll notice in this pattern is that REM is more concentrated towards the end of the night. So again, if you're shorting yourself on sleep, you're getting up earlier because you got stuff to do, you're gonna short yourself on REM sleep. And REM sleep is extraordinarily important for our, our cognitive and emotional well-being. It's also the stage of sleep where we have those dreams, those wild, crazy, like, honey, you wouldn't believe what I dreamt last night. Most of those occur during REM, REM sleep. And so often, as you can see, REM occurs right before wakefulness, you'll wake up from a crazy wild dream and then get ready for your day. Uh, REM is also interesting. If you look at the brainwave activity of REM, it looks very, very similar to wakeful brainwave tracings. So what happens with aging and sleep? Well, I, I think any of us who are more than 20 years old understand that, gosh, you know, I don't sleep as well as I used to. And there's a variety of factors that really go into that. And again, you can see looking at the slide uh, in infancy, lots and lots and lots of REM. Uh, as I mentioned, newborns up to 50%, we get mature and our REM sleep goes down to 15 to 20%. And then as we get into old age, uh, define that how you would like, um, REM sleep's typically 10% or less. And there's a myth out there that old people need less sleep and that's not true. They, they need as much sleep as they do when they're younger. It's just harder for a variety of factors that are part of aging. Basketball. So what does basketball have to do with sleep? Uh, on the left of the screen, we have Will Ferrell, I'm sorry, uh, Steph Curry doing what he does. And on the right, we have uh, Will Ferrell trying to make free, show, free throw shots with uh, an underhand approach. And the reason I bring this up is uh, in general, my experience has been that insomniacs hate people who sleep well. well. Why is that? There's a lot of things going to sleep, but one of it is just an innate talent. Some people are just naturally or genetically wired to sleep well. Steph Curry, you know, Steph Curry's put a lot of work into his talent. He had some, you know, inherent talent that he has nurtured. Uh, and some people inherently just don't sleep well. And, you know, maybe Will Ferrell is the, the basketball equivalent to that. So insomnia, very common problem. We'll touch on that. And how do we define it? You know, some people say, well, gosh, you know, I just, I just can't fall asleep. Once I get to sleep, I do great. 
or gee, I fall asleep just fine and I wake up and I can't get back to sleep. Um, or, you know, I sleep okay, but it just never feels like I'm getting a good night's sleep. And of course, this can be associated with distress and, and dysfunction and a whole variety of things that we had reviewed early on in the, the talk. Prevalence, very common. I mean, most people have experienced insomnia at some point in their life. Um, 20 to 30 to 40% um, have persistent insomnia. Distress and impairment is up to almost 20% of folks. And that's a lot if you take into the number of people that suffer from this. And for some reason, and again, there's a, there's a lot of theories on this, that it tends to be more common in women. Uh, women have a harder time falling asleep, staying asleep. And there's some science behind it. There's hormonal issues, um, there's psychological issues. But I, th I think the next slide really sums it up probably better than anything else, which is men and women are just, we're just different. We're just different animals. And maybe this, maybe this slide explains it, or maybe I'm going to get some hate mail, but uh, I, I stand by my slide. What happens when we don't sleep? Well, this is all pretty obvious because it, virtually everybody's had a bad night of sleep. You're tired, you're sluggish, you're sleepy, you, you don't feel good, you're stressing about sleep and stress will touch on mood disturbances. We tend to be grumpy, we can't focus. We're certainly not at our, at our top, top level in our place of employment. And despite how common this is, and despite how dramatic the effects can be on our daytime function, our physical and emotional and mental well-being, the vast majority of patients never discuss it with their physicians. Um, this is a study that was done on chronic insomniacs, and almost 70% of them never even brought up during a doctor's visit. Or they do what I call the door handle question. So they come into the doctor's office for something else, we're almost done with the visit. I'm about to leave the room. I got my hand on the door handle, leaving the exam room. Oh, by the way, doc, I'm not sleeping very well. Well, that's not the best way to do it. Um, Cause as we'll see, insomnia is very complicated. And it does take a very um, in-depth approach looking at a variety of factors to figure it out. And again, as you can see here, only 5% of chronic insomniacs ever scheduled a specific appointment to discuss their insomnia. Well, insomnia is complicated, right? It's not just one thing. It's not just, oh, flip the sleep switch and, and, and to bed you go and things are good. Um, a lot of different things can lead to arousal, which is kind of the kryptonite of sleep. There's medications, uh, substances, uh, alcohol is one of the common ones, uh, circadian factors. Sometimes people's inherent circadian rhythm is out of rhythm with their actual required sleep pattern. Uh, medical and neurological factors, uh, that list is very, very long. Um, psychiatric disorders, uh, it's almost the rule, not the exception, that people with untreated psychiatric disease have disrupted sleep. Behavioral factors, we'll talk more about that. We already reviewed how age can influence this. And then primary sleep pathology, um, there's things like restless leg syndrome, and of course, sleep apnea, which we'll touch on a little later in the talk. And then lastly, acute stressors. Has anybody experienced stress this year? I bet you have. Um, so we, we know about COVID, uh, it's, it's growing every day. Uh, the science with COVID has been very interesting. In, in traditional science and traditional research, it's years between the time you come up with your hypothesis, you design a study, you get it run through an internal review board or an institution, you do your study, you do your statistics, you have peer review, you send it to a, a scientific journal, they look at it, they send it back. Um, this can take several years. And in the current pandemic, we're doing this in the space of weeks and months. And so this is one of the reasons why a lot of the things that you heard last month about COVID are not true this month. It's just, we're, we're, we're pushing science to its absolute limit. And with that, there's, there's some inherent um, there's some inherent uh, inaccuracies, I guess. So there was one study that was done in China back in March. Um, I guess they had a few doctors who weren't busy dealing with COVID and looked at sleep. They looked at 3,000 people, and this included a combination of people both in healthcare and people not in healthcare. And these are new complaints. So these aren't insomniacs who are sleeping worse. Acute insomnia, 20% of the population. Anxiety, almost that much, and depression, double that amount. 
And then when they, they threshed out the healthcare workers, those numbers nearly doubled. These are people on the front lines trying to help their patients, trying to save lives, and at the same time, trying to protect their own health and their own well-being. And as you can imagine, insomnia was very prevalent. 35% had insomnia, 45% had anxiety, and up to 50% had depression. So again, huge, huge influence of stress and all these emotional factors, and, and of course, sleep. So this is one type of insomnia. And again, there's entire books written just on insomnia. So we can't get into all the various aspects or even causes. But psychophysiologic insomnia is a really big word and doctors like big words because it makes us feel smart. So we say psychophysiologic insomnia and the patient looks at you and going, what? So what that means is that there's usually some type of initiating factor, something that starts, that stops you from falling asleep or maintaining sleep. Once that happens, suddenly sleep is not just a normal thing that happened. It's like, oh, I'm going to go to bed and sleep. But now it's like, gosh, I didn't sleep well last night. So am I going to sleep tonight? And gosh, I'm not sleeping. Well, that fear and frustration leads to psychological activation. So if we're stressed, we're frustrated, we're angry, we don't fall asleep. Those are not good things to promote good sleep onset. And so then we sit there and go, okay, I'm going to outsmart this. I'm going to outsmart my sleep. And of course, again, we're stimulating ourselves. And this leads to the vicious cycle of sleep uh, initiation and, and maintenance difficulty. And this is a very, very, very common problem. I spend a lot of my time being almost a counselor and trying to work people through these steps of understanding these patterns, um, these kind of failed efforts at getting more sleep to actually maintain sleep. So how does insomnia involve? And, and this is very basic and very stylized, but, but it's an important concept. So most of us live here, using my little pointer here, um, well below the insomnia threshold. So below this threshold, we sleep just great. Above this threshold, we're not sleeping so good. So baseline, we live here. Then something stressful happens like, well, a COVID pandemic. And oh my gosh, I can't sleep. And so we're pushed above our insomnia threshold. We don't sleep well. Normally, when the stressor pass, or we find ways of dealing with the stressor, or we just get so darn tired, we fall back asleep, we will fall back to the baseline. But if we don't do that, and we start developing those maladaptive behaviors while we're sleeping, which we'll go over, uh, then we can go from acute insomnia to chronic insomnia. This is not where we want to be. Here's an interesting study. This was done a number of years ago, hence the kind of janky looking uh, slide here. But I think this is a really important um, concept to, to understand. So there's folks who have acute insomnia, folks who normally sleep well, like the last slide, something happens, um, and usually can get them back to where they started. Chronic insomniacs are a different breed of folks. And when I see insomniacs, one of the first questions I ask is, how long has this been a problem? Oh, it's just been a problem since my son was born or, oh, it just happened since I lost my job. Other folks will say, gosh, this has been since I've been a teenager, even before I never slept well. Those, those folks are kind of the Will Ferrells of sleep. And so we can't ever expect them to sleep quote unquote normal. Um, and so there's one study looking at these folks and they did find a very interesting difference, which essentially is these two curves. The lower curve is their basal metabolic rate or essentially their metabolism whereas the chronic insomniacs in the upper curve seem to have a higher metabolism. They seem to be more wired, if you will. And one of the interesting things about chronic insomniacs is they tend not to be very sleepy. They're not people that are gonna fall asleep at work or fall asleep sitting in a stoplight. They tend to actually not be very sleepy. And maybe this finding here, this difference in their metabolism might explain that. It still doesn't help them feel any better. It's like, hey, you know, you're wired this way. So what do we do about this? Um, it's a complicated process. So the first thing is we have to just sit down and talk and figure out which of these many factors that go into insomnia are actually playing a role. Sleep hygiene is always the first stop on the train. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Once we get through that and we try to educate the patient as to why they're not sleeping well, things that they may be doing unintentionally to perpetuate the insomnia, then we come to the next box. Do we do non-pharmacologic therapy? And there's a variety of behavioral approaches. 
Uh, there's also another um, approach called cognitive behavioral therapy, another big word, doctors like those. But essentially, it's a psychologist who specializes in some, who works through the psychology of sleep. And then, of course, there's pharmacologic therapy, which needless to say, is way overused. Why spend all this time talking to a counselor and working through these issues and changing my lifestyle habits and, and exercising and eating better and avoiding alcohol when I could just take a pill, right? We take a pill for pretty much anything. But of course, that's that old um, give a man a fish versus teaching a man to fish. If we teach people how to sleep, then we don't have to give them the sleeping pills, which of course have a lot of potential long-term side effects. And a lot of this is done in primary care. There's just not really enough sleep specialists to go around. Um, I've given a lot of talks to primary care physicians to kind of get them up to speed on this. But occasionally when things just are not working, they've tried everything and they come to a dead end, uh, usually that's where a sleep specialist will get involved. So what do we do? And again, how long has this been going on? Is this just since a life event or did this, has this been your whole life? That really is a fork in the road. And again, we look for underlying causes. Um, restless leg syndrome is highly overlooked. Patients are really reluctant to talk about it because they think it's quote unquote, all in their head. Well, it's not. This is a very, very disturbing syndrome where when people are at rest, usually trying to fall asleep, they have this very difficult to describe sensation in their legs that they can't make go away. It's an uncomfortable sensation and it won't go away unless they move their legs. Well, if you're moving your legs, you're not sleeping. And then as soon as they quit moving their legs, the sensation comes back. Uh, it's a very, very treatable and common cause of insomnia. And it's always something to ask about, or if you're on the receiving end of it, certainly share with your physician. Sleep apnea, again, we'll talk a little bit about it, but uh, it's again, a very common cause of insomnia. And not every patient with sleep apnea has those classic symptoms of just not being able to stay awake and falling asleep and, you know, going across the dividers while they're driving, et cetera. Some of those folks, their only complaint is disrupted sleep. Again, daytime symptoms are an important part of that. Um, sleep habits, uh, you know, again, we talked about people intentionally depriving themselves of sleep. So I always have patients fill out a two week sleep log when they go to bed, when they get up, what they did before and after bed. And a lot of times we'll recognize patterns that they were not aware of and certainly I wasn't aware of until we looked at the sleep log. And the metaphor I always tell them is it, it's kind of like fi filling out a, a food log. You know, if you write down every single night what you had for dinner, after a while you might realize, gosh, I never realized every Thursday night we have pizza. So sometimes these patterns do come across and uh, they're very helpful in helping resolve the problem. We talked about medications, psychiatric issues, neurologic issues. There are a lot of medications that are very, very common out there that are not commonly recognized to disrupt sleep. There are certain blood pressure medications, allergy medicines. There's a whole variety of medications that can actually disrupt sleep. So it's really important if you see a physician for insomnia to bring that list and, and put everything on there too, including herbal supplements. There are a lot of um, herbal supplements that are designed for quote unquote memory or um, improving your, your smarts or whatever. A lot of these just have stimulants in them and it's like, like caffeine. It's like, that's why I feel better is because I, I got this stimulant in me. And then of course, health habits. Uh, you know, we talk about exercise and eating properly and, and, and not drinking alcohol before bed. But the bottom line, and this is very, very brief what I've given you, it's complicated. This is not a one-stop thing. And that ties back to that slide I showed about Patients not going to their physician with this complaint and not scheduling a visit just to look at this. This is not a handle on the doorknob question. And if it is, unfortunately, the most common response is, okay, well, here's some sleeping pills. See you next week. So this is probably the most important slide of this talk. Um, hopefully there's some snickers out there, but then people are like, oh yeah, I do that. Yeah, uh, it, it's very common because again, that's a place where there's no distractions and you can get stuff done and you can do your email, make your calls and get ready for tomorrow's presentation. Well, subconsciously what's happening is the brain's understanding, well, gosh, then bed's a place to get stuff done. Why would I go to sleep here? So it's kind of one of those activating mechanisms. And, you know, it's extraordinarily important if you have difficulty sleeping to have a relaxing bedtime routine. Um, I usually advise an hour or two at best Dim lights around the house because light promotes wakefulness. We want dim lights, 
reading is awesome, but it shouldn't be reading on a tablet, shouldn't be reading on a computer. Get these old things um, made out of paper, um, books, yes, books. Get a book, dim light, don't get an exciting you know, adventure novel, something that's relatively calm and easy to read. You gotta have downtime. You can't just go from 100 miles an hour to jumping in bed, and you certainly can't go from doing all this to falling asleep. Another important slide, remember bed is only for two things. And I think most people kind of understand what those should be. Of course, there's that. Sleeping is a very important part of being in bed and not much else except for, well, that. So what do we do to treat insomnia? Um, and I kind of touched on this as well. Uh, you know, there's the, the non-pharmacologic approaches, which I'm going to touch on. Uh, pharmacology actually does have a role. Um, all sleeping pills are not bad and all people taking sleeping pills are not bad or dumb people. Uh, but I think it's really important to use them judiciously and for as a short amount of time as possible. So this is the first step. You can just get yourself a, a herd of sheep. Um, this is a little hill in uh, northern New Zealand where I met a bunch of sheep. There's a variety of approaches. Again, this is not a flip a switch kind of issue. I'm gonna mostly focus on uh, these. Um, down the bottom, I'll just touch on real quick. Some people's circadian rhythm, uh, their inherent sleep wait cycles, like whether they're owl, whether they're a lark, um, a lot of times that comes into play. And the reason that they're having such a horrible time sleeping is they're trying to sleep outside their internal rhythm. And there's ways of approaching that cognitive therapy, you know, psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy that works, relaxation training. This is not to be scoffed at. Uh, things like mindfulness, yoga, um, biofeedback, these things actually really work. Uh, they take time, they take money, they take um, persistence. Those things do work. Sleep restriction is something that we rarely do. It, it's a very, very difficult approach, but essentially if somebody says, I only sleep five hours a night. And they say, well, okay, well then how many hours you spend in bed? Oh, of course, I'll spend eight hours in bed. I need hours of sleep. Well, no, actually what you get is you get five and a half hours in bed. And then when you can sleep more than 90% of that, then you get five hours and 45 minutes of sleep. And then she's like, what are you trying to do? Kill me? Well, it, it, it's an approach. Honestly, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline and it, it's usually not very successful. Um, stimulus control. This is just basic, basic stuff. If you've got three dogs sleeping on your bed with you who are getting up, moving around, licking things, doing dog stuff, you're not going to sleep. You got a quiet, calm, appropriately temperature control, minimal light, comfortable sleeping environment. And that's extraordinarily important. I know it's hard kicking the dogs out of bed. They want to be there, but you know, sleep's important. And of course, sleep hygiene. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, all of this makes sense. Every bit of it that you look at, like, oh yeah, I've regularized my sleep and wake cycle, uh, avoid stimulants and stimulating behavior, establish a relaxing bedtime routine. We just kind of touched on that. Conducive sleep environment, we talked about that. Are naps bad? Um, back when we had live audiences, I'd say, okay, well, are naps bad? And invariably somebody, oh yeah, yeah, you shouldn't nap. Well, the reality is naps are just fine uh, within certain constraints. Uh, one is that if you're having difficulty sleeping at night, then you should not waste your sleep coupons on napping during the day. And it's tough because you sleep crummy during the night, you don't want to take a nap because you're tired. But again, you want to maximize the, the what we call sleep pressure, the, the essentially drive to sleep when you're going to bed. Conversely, if you sleep great at night and you want to take a quick power nap in the afternoon, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting, we discussed circadian rhythms. We all have a very big dip in our circadian rhythm, in other words, a very big drive to sleep around three or four in the morning. Um, I don't know how, when last time any of you stayed up all night, but what you'll notice is it gets really hard around that time in the morning, three or four in the morning, you're just like, wow, this is tough. But if you work through that and you get through till say six or seven in the morning, even though you haven't slept, you start feeling more alert. And these are hormonal shifts and circadian rhythm shifts. But we also have another dip in the afternoon and it's usually around two or three in the afternoon uh invariably people can attribute it to lunch it has really nothing to do with lunch 
uh, it's just a little dip in our circadian rhythm, a little downturn where those sleep hormones kick in a little bit. Uh, in, in a lot of the European countries, they figured this out. They don't fight nature. They have the siesta. You know, all the shops close, everybody goes home, take a nap, go back and open up. And what do we do here? Well, we go to the coffee shop. You know, go, go to Starbucks around two or three in the afternoon and you'll be in line, uh, six feet apart, hopefully. Um, regular exercise, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over caffeine and alcohol. Needless to say, caffeine is a stimulant. Alcohol is not good either. Alcohol has a very unearned reputation of being a good sleep medicine. It is not. What it does is it promotes light sleep. So yeah, you fall asleep easier, but it suppresses deep sleep. So you get this tossy, turny, terrible sleep. And it is really not a good thing for sleep. I tell most patients, if you like to have a beer or glass of wine, whatever, do it around dinner time. There really should be a couple hours between your last alcohol and going to bed. Exercise is extraordinarily important. Uh, there's a lot of hormonal things that happen with exercise. Um, and again, it pr promotes good sleep. Clock watching is terrible. Why? You wake up. Oh, it's 3 a.m. Damn. It's 3.15. Oh, no. Now it's 3.30. Uh-oh. It's going to be a bad night. And that perpetuates the problem. You know, you can set the alarm, turn the thing around. Don't look at it because, again, it perpetuates the insomnia. And, of course, we talked about devices. Uh, we all have them. They're part of our lives. If you want to sleep well, you got to get away from them, especially before bedtime and especially not waking up. Well, it's 3 a.m. Let's see what's happening on Facebook. Uh, it, it obviously doesn't work. So these are the basics of sleep hygiene. And I got this picture up here in the corner of this guy do, flossing his teeth. He's got very nice teeth. And why? Because he does good dental hygiene. And sleep hygiene is the same way. So if you do good dental hygiene, you have really good teeth. And if you do good sleep hygiene, you have really good sleep. If you don't have good sleep hygiene, then your sleep functionally looks like that. And it's not very pretty. We'll move on. So when do we use sleep medications? Well, we talked again about acute stress and maybe I should have put my COVID slide right there. Um, tremendous amount of stress, disruption of life, economy, income, changes in changes in the way we live. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's pandemic of stress, you know, aside from the virus. And so we do use sleep medications in some of these uh, circumstances. So acute stress, you know, somebody comes in, they just lost their job, they're under financial strain, they're, you know, they can't stand being in the house with their, their family all day, every day for months and months on end. So pharmacologic therapy medications does have a role but the idea is we're treating it in the short term. We're addressing, uh, we're trying to get people over the hump. We're addressing the issues and then moving on, not looking at using these things in the long term. Um, predictable stress, like, you know, gosh, I have, I've got a final tomorrow and I need to get sleep before the test. And sometimes we'll use it in that way. Uh, I got a big interview, et cetera. You know, it's okay to take something and get a good night's sleep. Shift work and jet lag, again, has roles here. Um, Jet lag is relatively easy. Um, shift work is, is difficult because of the shifts they work, when they work them, how much they transition back to a normal sleep cycle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the best way if anybody is a shift worker um, on a rotating shift is rotate according to the clock. So the worst shift work you can have is, well, yeah, I work grades this week and then next week I work days and the week after that I work nights and then they then somebody is out, so then I work three nights, and then two graves, then a day. Very difficult. It can be done if it's on a rotating schedule. And what I say is follow the clock. So go from days to gray, I'm sorry, to days to swings to graves, and then back again. And if you do that, uh, it is it is doable. Um, they st it still has adverse effects on sleep and well being because you just can't sleep well during the day, uh, but we can't work around it. And of course, chronic insomnia, you know, chronic insomnia down here. Um, some of those folks, we do everything we can do. There's just not getting past it. And some of my patients I do have on chronic sleep medications with certainly close monitoring. So this is a slide. I love this slide. This was, uh, came out, gosh, 15 years ago now. Um, there was a drug called Lunesta. And Lunesta came out. It's a sleeping pill. And they had these great ads. So they showed this, this woman sleeping with this, this Mona Lisa smile on, this, on her face and this little butterfly flying around. And, and so it was brilliant marketing because 
what it implied was, oh, this is, this is the way I'm supposed to sleep with a butterfly and a smile on my face. Well, I don't sleep like that, so I must need their medicine, right? Great marketing, but uh, needless to say, the, the wrong message. Medications, um, complicated, very, very busy slide. Um, there are a lot of medicines for sleep. Uh, most of them have a lot of downsides. Um, benzodiazepines, the first line, these are all relatives of Valium. Um, these and the next line, uh, GABA receptor I'm sorry, GABA receptor agonists, uh, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata. Uh, these work in the short term, they work fairly well. In the long term, there's actually data out there to show that if you use these things for years and decades, your chances of having dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, chronic memory loss go way, way up. Um, the second line, particularly Ambien, has also been associated with what they call sleep-related behaviors. So you'll hear these crazy stories of, yeah, I took an Ambien, I went to sleep, and I drove to 7-Eleven, and I bought a Slurpee and a big bag of potato chips and a six-pack of beer, and I drove home and got home and didn't know all that stuff was in my house when I got up in the morning. These things do happen. Thankfully, they're rare, but they do happen. Um, most over-the-counter sleeping medicines are antihistamines like Benadryl. Um, if you ever have time and interest, you can go down the allergy aisle at your drugstore, pick up a few boxes, and then walk over to the sleep aisle and pick up a few boxes, and then look at the ingredients. It's all the same stuff. Histamine is actually a alerting chemical in our brain. It's a wakefulness chemical. It's a neurochemical that helps our alertness and wakefulness. It rises during the day. It falls during the night. So how does Benadryl work? is an antihistamine. We're kind of offsetting the effects of histamine. There's a variety of antidepressants that also have sedative side effects that are used for sleep. Um, again, none of these things were initially designed or FDA approved for sleep. We're essentially using them for their side effects. And that alone should be a little bit of a red flag. It's like, well, wait, I'm taking the medicine so I can get the side effect. You know, there's gotta be better ways. Um, herbal remedies get a lot of attention. Um, virtually every insomniac has tried melatonin, even large medical institutions give them to their inpatients to help promote sleep. Valerian, at best, on a really good day, these things help a little bit. They're not magic bullets. Antipsychotics, you're really moving up the line, uh, doing things like Seroquel. There's a new drug out there called Belsomera, um, and it's very, very unique in its action. Virtually every, I shouldn't say virtually, pretty much everything on this list will promote sleep. Essentially, it's flipping the sleep switch on. Belsamra actually works as an orexin antagonist. Orexin is another alerting chemical in our brain. It's very operative in a disorder called narcolepsy. It turns the wake switch off. It's like, wow, that really makes sense. So if I'm having trouble falling asleep, why don't I just turn the wake switch off? This should work great. And this drug came out with a great deal of fanfare. It's like, wow, finally we're getting to something that may solve the problem. Um, the sad part of it is that I've used this probably, I don't know, 10 times, maybe 15 in my practice. Uh, I think I've had one patient who had a good response. So although the promise in the uh, pharmacology was promising, I've not yet seen the results. Um, hormonal therapy, you know, we talked a little bit about women in sleep. That can be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, menopause is almost uniformly associated with sleep disturbances. Uh, hormonal replacement therapy actually works quite well, but it certainly needs to be done in consultation with the, the patient's gynecologist to be sure that they don't have any reason not to take estrogens. Estrogen got a really bad rap um, several years ago, uh, increasing heart disease and strokes and blood clots, et cetera. But they were studying much higher doses. We've now realized it doesn't really take a large dose to actually have a therapeutic effect. And that's where we're going now. And so a lot of my patients that have this issue, I'll work with their uh, gynecologist to find uh, an appropriate estrogen dose. And of course, nightcap, we talked about that. Oh, I'm having trouble falling asleep. I'll have a shot of whatever. Don't do it. So that's a quick overview of insomnia. Again, this is a really complicated topic. Um, you know, I've, I've gone to conferences where it was a three-day seminar just looking at insomnia. So it's really hard to touch on every aspect of it. You know, as I mentioned before, it's complicated. You got to look at a lot of different things. Uh, first, we got to rule out a primary sleep disorder, which I'll talk about. When I talk about restless legs, I'll talk a little bit about sleep apnea, medical problems, pain issues. I know there's already, already one question in the queue about 
pain and, and sleep. Sleep hygiene is probably the most important takeaway from this talk, including getting exercise, avoiding caffeine. Uh, I didn't mention nicotine, at least to say it's a, it's a stimulant. Um, naps, proper position in bed, relaxation techniques, sleep environment. Uh, we talked a little about sleep medications. They do have a role, but that should be the last stop on the train, not the first stop. So what about sleep apnea? Go through this real quick. It's one of my favorite subjects. Why? Um, you know, I've been practicing medicine for, for quite a while. You know, you treat somebody's blood pressure, you make their blood sugar better, you lower their cholesterol. They don't come in and say, wow, doc, that changed my life. But I'll tell you, you fix somebody's sleep problem, you treat their sleep apnea and they're getting good night's sleep and they feel better during the day. I hear that more often than, than probably I even deserve to hear. It's just fantastic to have a patient come in and say, that changed my life. So what is it? Well, sleep apnea is common, dangerous, recognizable, and very treatable. Symptoms, uh, these are just the classic symptoms that many, many patients with sleep apnea have. Loud snoring. It's, it's important to note that snoring is very common. Most people do it. The vast majority of patients who snore do not have sleep apnea. However, virtually everybody who has sleep apnea snores. Episodic cessation of breathing, like, oh, he quits breathing and I have to elbow him to make him breathe again. We hear that a lot. Daytime sleepiness, dry mouth headaches in the morning, moodiness, memory problems, accidents. I've, I've literally had two patients walk into my office bandaged up from car accidents saying, okay, it's time to get this looked at. Um, so what happens, uh, this is... So imagine we take somebody, we put them on a bandsaw, we cut them this way, and we're kind of looking at the middle of them. So this is the tongue right here. This is the soft palate, epiglottis. This is a normal airway. Um, it, you can see it's pretty tenuous. This is all soft tissue. It's all soft, floppy, movable stuff. Then we lay on our black backs at night. Gravity starts taking a roll. And then, of course, we get in deep sleep. Our muscles relax. And so it's a pretty tenuous circumstance that we have. But this is a normal airway during sleep that things do stay open and air, air can get down here in the trachea. In sleep apnea, usually for a variety of anatomical factors, uh, tongue drops back, soft palate drops back, partially or completely occludes the airway, and then the, no oxygen is going in. So the brain's like, well, gosh, I really need to breathe, but I really need to sleep. Well, thankfully, breathing almost always wins. That person wakes up, gas, snort fall back asleep. And this can happen over and over and over. This can happen 20, 40, 60. I've seen over a hundred times an hour on sleep studies. And you know, my first question to the patient is like, how do you wake up in the morning? This is crazy. And what are the consequences? Well, if you guys were paying attention, hopefully you were, a lot of the things you're seeing here were in that first slide of inadequate sleep. It's pretty much the same stuff. Uh, the good news is that we can treat it. We can make a big difference there. So nowadays, um, sleep labs are much, much better than they were in days of old. This is actually a picture of the sleep lab at Barton. You can see it's set up to be as normal of a sleep environment as possible. We have some monitors and things in here, the technicians in a separate room. Um, and this used to be the rule. This used to be what we had. So anybody who had a sleep disorder that we wanted to study, we had to do it in a sleep lab. But jump forward and now we have great home sleep study technology. This is the whole device. It just sits on the forehead. It monitors a variety of parameters. This cannula measures airflow. These things work well and for otherwise healthy patients or even patients that don't have any major medical problems, these work actually really, really well. Well, how do we treat it? Um, in the old days, we did a lot of surgery. We don't do surgery much anymore. It's, it's very painful. We'd go in and slice off the soft palate and take this bone here in the chin and pull it forward and twist it out and screw it back in and sometimes cut the jaws up here and move everything forward. Um, hard to get people to sign up for that. And again, our, our treatments, our non-surgical treatments are much better. This is a dental appliance and essentially what it's designed to do, it's a custom built mouthpiece essentially is designed to use these upper teeth and a band or a piston, a whole variety of approaches to kind of leverage the jaw forward. So the jaw is attached to the tongue. So as the tongue goes forward, the jaw goes forward, snoring goes away. And this can actually be very uh, effective for, for a lot of patients. This is what one looks like in real life. Um, again, custom built. These bands are adjustable. 
different tensions. And again, there's a variety of designs. This is nice because it can go anywhere, pretty much fits in your pocket. You wash it in the morning, you're done. CPAP's a whole different story. And again, things are slipped backwards. So now the top of the head here, neck is here. Here's our obstructed airway. Here's the, the theoretical CPAP that's providing air pressure. And that air pressure acts like an air pillow or pneumatic splint. And that air pressure keeps the airway from collapsing. And you think it would take a lot of pressure to do that, but it really doesn't. And these things work quite well. They also have a bad reputation. So yeah, in the old days, this was actually truly a sleep mask. This was called a, a, a Mirage. This was probably one of the more common masks we use. Kind of a hard sell to get people signed up for it. And then of course you get all these memes, you know, I, I guess there's some resemblance there. Um, and so we're really trying to dispel this, uh, this notion of CPAP because things are infinitely better than they were years ago. Um, this is the new setup. You can see very small mask. It goes under the nose. It's all soft plastic. It's very malleable. The tubes attach the top. So when you're rolling around at night, the tube's not in your way. The machines are much smaller. They're compact. Um, they work much better and they actually give us data. They actually have built in sleep studies. So after a few weeks, we pop the chip out of these. We can plug it in the computer, see exactly how well it works and make adjustments right there on the spot. And there's an app for that too. So all the machines now have apps so you can see how well you did last night using your machine. And there are travel machines as well. Um, it's not really that small. It's not true to size. It pretty, this pretty much fits in the palm of your hand. So people who need this, who travel a lot, this is an option. And that's the happy ending. There is, this is actually an older machine. You can see they're kind of bigger and clunkier, um, but uh, I just want to show a, a happy slide at the end. So this is a notorious uh, gunslinger from the Old West, John Wesley Harding. Uh, this quote has been attributed to him many, many times. They tell lots of lies about me. They say I killed six or seven men for snoring. Well, it ain't true. I only killed one man for snoring. Uh, interestingly, he ended up going to prison for killing somebody, um, studied law while he was in prison, got out, got out of prison and started a law practice. And then uh, about a year later, one of his... Uh, prior enemies found him and shot him dead. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, Natasha is going to manage the, the question and answer session. Um, I hopefully put some questions in the queue and uh, I will let Natasha bring those out and I'll try my best to answer them. So really appreciate your attention. Um, the Zoom format's a little weird for me. I like seeing people's faces, even if they're asleep, but uh, we'll do the best we can with the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Tredell. Um, we have a couple questions coming in. And just as a reminder, um, if you're on Zoom, you can ask the questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. The first question um, is asking about whether, um, let's see, she, uh, this person, um, they're able to fall asleep, but they wake up two to three hours later because of pain. And then they have to take more medication and wait about an hour for it to start working. And then they go through that cycle again. The question is, are there any techniques to help sleep with pain? Well, I guess the only advantage of that particular circumstance is that it's predictable. And so if it's predictable, it's a lot easier to kind of plan around it. Um, I didn't get a sense of what they're using for pain. Um, a lot of folks, you know, use opiates for pain and, and they are appropriate for certain folks. Um, they have a half-life. So short acting opiates will last, you know, maybe three to four hours. So it might be one thing to look at is, would they be a candidate for a longer acting opiates or longer acting pain medicine of whatever type that will actually get you through the night. Um, the other potential option for that is if it's predictable, like, okay, I sleep for four hours, I'm awake on the fifth hour, and then I lay there and I suffer for an hour waiting for the medicine to kick in is potentially just setting an alarm for maybe three or four hours into sleep with the pain medication there at the bedside with a little glass of water. So you take it, fall easily back to sleep. And then when that, that time of pain kick, kicking in comes that hopefully it's, it's still on board. The pain is very challenging. Um, it's very difficult to sleep when you're in pain and there's very little we can do to make pain go away. Uh, we make pain better. We try to make it tolerable, uh, but it is challenging. There's you know other techniques, different mattresses, pillows between the legs, 
you know, finding position of best comfort. And, and a lot of that's very specific to what's causing the pain. Great. So the next question is kind of similar in nature, just asking, you know, feeling like they might have some level of insomnia. They wake up several times a night and um, maybe up for an hour or so, go back to bed. Um, but at this point, don't feel like it's um, affecting them negatively. They're still in a good mood and energetic during the day. Um, the question is, should they wait um, and until it affects them negatively or consider going to their um, primary care provider or a specialist now? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really, really good question. So, um, you know, and again, unfortunately, I can't see faces, so I can't really assess the age of the people asking the questions. Um, I can almost assure you that it's not a 20 year old person. Um, so, you know, as we get older, sleep gets more difficult and it becomes more fragmented. And what I mean by that is when we're young, we go to bed, stay asleep, wake up eight or nine hours later with sheet creases in our face. Um, as we get older, sleep tends to be a lot more fragmented. There's a lot more awakenings. And sometimes those awakenings are followed by periods of wakefulness. Uh, it really is driven by levels of stress and daytime function. So if you just go, okay, this is me and it's not causing distress, it's not causing dysfunction. Um, you know, certainly looking at sleep hygiene and looking for things that you can do to improve that, virtually everybody can, virtually everybody who read that list can find something they could do a little better. Um, but I think the bottom line, um, one, of my, one of my favorite mentors when I was in training told me, don't trouble trouble till trouble troubles you. And I, I think that would be the answer to that question. But again, go back and look at sleep hygiene, go back and look at factors that could be impairing that continuous sleep at night and understand that as we do get older, sleep is more fragmented. There are more awakenings and sometimes longer awakenings. And it's, it's kind of part of the game. And, you know, I think acceptance um, also goes a long way in, in avoiding that psychophysiologic cycle that we talked about. It's like, ah, oh, I didn't fall asleep after 3 a.m. What's tonight going to be like? And then pretty soon it's perpetuating. And it sounds like that person is doing a good job of not doing that. Great. So this is another question about um, sleep, but more about the length. So sister-in-law has a 13-year-old nephew who's never needed that much sleep, according to the recommended numbers you had mentioned. What are long-term disadvantages, or is there a way to train him now to sleep more? He doesn't seem tired during the day or sluggish. Yeah, it's a complicated issue. You know, unfortunately, I'm working on limited information. Um, you know, typically, 13-year-olds sleep really, really well. Um, and, you know, if he's sleeping, you know, far less than that, you know, 10 hours a night, it could be several factors. One thing, again, children get sleep apnea and their symptoms are very different than adults. Um, children usually either have no daytime symptoms or uh, younger children, usually younger than 13, their symptom, instead of being sleepy, will actually be hyperactive. A lot of kids that have supposed ADD are actually sleep deprived and that's just how they react. Um, there is a small, small number of folks out there that are actually what we call short sleepers. So these are rare individuals who actually don't require the normal amount of sleep. Um, it is a bell-shaped curve. And so way out on the curve, there are folks who only really need four to six hours of sleep. Those are rare folks. Um, I think it would be worth, um, you know, next time you're in a pediatrician for, you know, what, whatever simple issue to kind of bring that up and just see if there is some pathology associated with it. Again, for me with limited information, it's kind of hard to give a, a really good answer on that. But I think it's unlikely that that's just a normal variant and it is more likely to be reflective of something else going on. And that something else list is kind of long. Great, so I'm gonna combine the next two questions. It's asking about um, whether CBD Austin, also valerian root. Um, what are your thoughts on those two? Sure. Yeah, I get a lot of questions on that. Um, so the, the data on CBD is, well, I, I step back. So, so studying, you know, marijuana, marijuana related uh, substances and their effects pretty much on anything, including sleep is pretty complicated because, uh, you know, marijuana is not one thing. There's, there's different strains. There's, I guess, indicas and um, there, there's other strains. I don't, I, I can't list them. And then, you know, these uh, substances also have varying combinations of THC and CBD. So one strain may have be, you know, 20% uh, 
THC and 80% CBD and another strain might be the opposite. Pure CBD itself has been studied a little bit, certainly not a magic bullet. In some studies, it does show that it helps sleep onset, uh, meaning falling asleep easier, but it's not a big potent like, oh, take this CBD gummy, you're gonna fall asleep. You know, one of the bigger limitations and trying to be political is we don't have a lot of good research on marijuana and marijuana related uh, substances because it's still illegal from a federal standpoint, despite the fact it's legal for uh, medicinal and non-medicinal purposes in probably half the states. Um, the good news is there's no real toxicity from it. And, you know, if it's something you're going down the list, you want to try things, I don't see a problem with trying it. Uh, anything you try, you must give several nights because our sleep will vary night to night. And what you don't want to do is make a judgment on one single night. So you want to give it several nights, um, you know, follow whatever recommendations are on the bottle. But again, understand that there's not a lot of science supporting it. Valerian has been uh, touted as a great sleep medicine for a long time. If you go uh, in, to the herbal aisle in your pharmacy or, or, or grocery store, you'll see a lot of things for sleep. Uh, usually they're a combination of a lot of different things. And again, we have no idea what that combination does. They invariably contain melatonin and valerian. For most people, they help a little bit. Um, they're not a magic bullet. And again, you got to be sure you're not trying to overcome bad lifestyle habits to, to get good sleep by taking valerian or melatonin. Uh, the next question is about um, how reliable are devices like Fitbit and Apple Watches for sleep track, sleep tracking. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I smile because half patients come and see me and I was like, look at my Fitbit. Look what's going on here. Are you kidding me? Um, so I was at a sleep conference uh, about two years ago, back when we used to get to go to sleep conferences. I, I miss those days. Um, and uh, they, they had one of the sessions they had was looking at all these various devices. There's a bunch of them out there. There's Fitbit, Apple does it a little bit. There's a whole other variety of um, uh, dedicated devices you can set on your bed, under your bed, under your pillow, next to your bed, that kind of record sleep stages. And so we looked at all these different devices and, and the pros and cons. And then the moderator of the session um, actually used them. And what he did was very interesting. He used, I think there was nine of them and he used all of them simultaneously in one night and then, then looked at, compared the outputs. Cause again, it's the same sleep that's looking at from various um, perspectives and devices. And there was not a great correlation uh, between the devices. What one device called REM, another sleep device called wakefulness, another device called it deep sleep. They seem to be pretty good in determining light sleep, but then he tried to, to fool the devices. So he got up in the middle of the night dedicated scientist and he just got up and just sat quietly and read for an hour. And I think, I think about 70% of the devices said he was in light sleep. So my, my instruction to my patients are look at this for interest, look at it as a novelty, don't make any decisions about your life about it. And most importantly, don't stress about, Oh my God, I only got 5% REM sleep. The devices are just, they're just not that good. I, I think it really right now is, is more of a novelty than anything else. Great, uh, next question. Is a referral needed to do a sleep study test? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, I know in South Lake, um, a lot of the primary care docs make direct referrals to the sleep lab. Um, you, you can't just call a sleep lab on your own in order to sleep study. Uh, and the reason is that you know, these are in, involved expensive tests and we want to be sure we're doing the right thing for you. Um, and again, I know a lot of the primary care docs in uh, South Lake order these tests directly into the sleep lab. And when they have patients that, you know, are more complicated, that haven't been able to figure out uh, or having trouble getting a handle on, that's usually when they come up and see me. Uh, what can you do if you are a sleepwalker? Well, it depends on age. Um, so sleepwalking uh, is in um, a category of sleep disorders, not even really disorder. Uh, they're called parasomnia. So this includes sleepwalking, sleep talking, uh, night terrors. If anybody's ever had a child with night terrors, the terror is on the parent, not the child. Uh, this is where they're asleep and they wake up in the middle of the night just screaming bloody murder. They're completely inconsolable. It's horrifying and terrifying for the patient or the parent rather. The patient goes back to bed and wakes up in the morning and has no recall of it. 
Um, so the parasomnias are normal. They're most common in kind of the eight to 13, 14 year old range. Um, sleepwalking is very common. Usually these are self-limited behaviors. Um, the, the old school is don't wake up a sleepwalker, something horrible will happen. You can wake them up and nothing bad will happen. Um, if you're living in a single story house and the child, I'm assuming it's a child, is walking around the house and then eventually goes back to bed. You don't need to worry about it. They grow out of it. Rarely um, dangerous behaviors will occur like crawling out windows and, and, and doing dangerous things. And in those circumstances, you have to do things to mitigate the danger, you know, putting locks on windows, even locks on doors. Uh, but the vast majority of sleepwalking is, is it's just normal, normal transition through, through childhood to adulthood and it doesn't require any specific therapy or intervention. Uh, next question is about a four-year-old daughter who moves a lot in her sleep. Should that be alarming? Um, full disclosure, I'm, I'm not a pediatric sleep specialist. Um, the short answer is probably not. Um, you know, sleep is a very active process. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting until the 1920s, Nobody studied sleep. They said, oh, we'll, we'll study them when they're awake because nothing's happening. And then in the late 30s and early 40s, there was a guy named Kleitman and uh, his, his intern, a guy named uh, Dement, who went on to be kind of the god of sleep medicine. They started studying sleep. It's like, there's a lot going on here. Um, so sleep is an active state. Uh, if the child is growing normally, functioning normally, uh, not having any uh, obvious daytime impairment, it's probably not anything to worry about. But that being said, I'm not a pediatrician. So if there's a big concern, I would certainly ask a pediatrician about it. Okay, we have another question. Um, this person is 81 years old, not overweight, exercises regularly, um, had leg pain, very restless, getting ready to go to bed, had spine surgery, but healed well. The big question is how often can uh, she take Tylenol PM? with a melatonin spray and what about TV in the bedroom? We actually had two questions about how people seem to be able to sleep well with TV on. I don't mm -hmm. know if you can hear that. Sure, um, so, it's, so it's a compound question. I'll try to keep track of all this. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of talked about sleep medicines and, and antihistamines, which is what Tylenol PM is. You know, I, I think the first thing I would try is just try the Tylenol without the PM um, because it's just pain keeping you awake the PM part, the antihistamine is not going to do much. Um, a lot of it really just depends on how you react. So, you know, yeah, technically 81 year olds shouldn't take antihistamines before they go to bed. But the flip side of that is if they take it and they sleep well and they wake up and they feel refreshed and they're not hung over and not having strange behaviors in the middle of the night. Yeah. I mean, you're 81, you should sleep well. If that does it for you, great. Um, but again, I, I think the first step is try the Tylenol alone without the antihistamine. Uh, older folks do tend to uh, slowly metabolize antihistamines. They can stick around in the morning or just having to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and get that unsteadiness, you know, falls and things like that are a concern. The second part of the question was, see, I didn't remember. TV, TV in, in the bedroom. Oh yeah, TV in the bedroom. Again, depends. It kind of takes, ties back to what we said about naps. And so if you got to watch the late show before you go to bed and then you go to bed and you fall asleep and you sleep your seven to nine hours and you wake up and you feel good, why not? Um, you know, technically it's against the rules of sleep hygiene, but those rules don't really apply if you're sleeping well. Um, the flip side is if you're an insomniac and you're struggle, struggling falling asleep and staying asleep, then yeah, getting rid of the TV and trading it out for one of those old printed book things with a dim light would be a good way to go. Next question is about sleep paralysis. 19 year old daughter thinks she has sleep paralysis where she wakes up and cannot move or speak. She's complained about it for at least a few weeks or a few years, I'm sorry. Does this condition exist? It absolutely exists. Um, and it can exist in really two circumstances. One is again, just a normal phenomenon of, of sleep. Um, it can, and again, not having the audience to actually talk to, uh, if, if this uh, late teenager is not getting enough sleep and is always really, really tired, being excessively sleep deprived and tired can actually cause sleep paralysis. 
What, what that is for those who are like, what is he talking about? Uh, sleep paralysis is an epiphenomenon of REM sleep. So we're in REM sleep, uh, we lose muscle tone. And there's probably some Darwinian reasons behind that. Uh, when we're in REM sleep, that's when remember, we have those active, crazy, violent dreams. Uh, we become paralyzed. Our muscles are paralyzed during REM sleep. And maybe the Darwinian part of it is so we don't beat our bed partner to death because we're fighting some monster or whatever in our dreams. So that can also sometimes spill over into daytime. So in other words, the patient wakes up, the dream is over, they're wide awake but that part of REM is sticking around. It is not dangerous, uh, even though it can be quite terrifying, nothing bad's gonna happen. And again, it can be part of just inadequate sleep. Sleep is, the sleep drive is so hard that REM is trying so hard to stick around, even when you're waking up, you'll experience sleep paralysis. That being said, 19 years old is the time in life that we can start seeing narcolepsy. And narcolepsy is a, a very well-studied disorder of dysregulation between wakefulness and sleep and sleep paralysis is part of narcolepsy. And so um, that patient, that late teen should probably be seen by a sleep specialist to be sure that it's just a normal epiphenomena of something else and not an early sign of narcolepsy. Great, we have a couple more questions. So thanks for hanging in there. Um, this next one is about being placed on a CPAP machine. How often should she consult with her provider to make sure uh, the settings are working. Yeah, so my, my typical practice, uh, when I start people on CPAP, I, you know, I give them a lot of information, a lot of coaching to try to make this work. Really, when you get over the first several week hump, most people do really well. I usually have them come back within the first couple weeks of starting it, mostly just to problem solve, like, hey, what's working, what's not? As I mentioned earlier, the nice part about modern CPAP machines is they're built-in sleep studies. So there's a little SIM card in there, you take it out, you stick it in a computer, you get this thing called a compliance report, and that'll tell you exactly how long you're using it, how well it's working. So certainly within, within at least the first month or two of starting on the CPAP machine, and sooner if it's not working for you. Uh, those compliance reports are just gold in terms of figuring out what's working, what's not, and making it work. The next question is, um, this person is sleep dreaming and starts talking and someone who's awake will, will start talking back with that person. Um, they'll have an actual conversation. Does that mean this person's not sleeping well? That, that, uh, think about that one, that's a little, little bizarre. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the, the stage of sleep that they're in at the time. I mean, that could potentially be um, I'm reaching a little bit, full disclosure. There's a disorder called REM behavior disorder, which is a terrible name because it sounds like patients are not behaving well. But essentially, it's just that when we talked about the Darwinian thing of being paralyzed during sleep, some people will develop a condition where they're not paralyzed during sleep. They can act out their dreams. And theoretically, if their dream is a conversation, that that could potentially happen. Um, again, real stretch to think that that's REM behavior disorder. Um, I would probably suggest if that person is dreaming and talking, just not talk to them and let them go back to sleep. Um, and again, if it's associated with other things like flat thrashing around at night, violent behaviors, disrupted sleep, those are things that should be looked at more. You know, as I mentioned several times, sleep is really complicated. There's a lot going on um, and it manifests in many, many different ways. Most of these things are benign and not worrisome when they are associated with harm or inadequate sleep or impaired daytime function, that's the time to take a closer look. Uh, do you have pillow recommendations for better sleep? Absolutely, the most comfortable one you can find. I say that tongue in cheek, but it's, <laughs> it's different for everybody. Some people like the big puffy down pillows, some people like the hard pillows, some people like two pillows, some people like three pillows and a pillow between their leg. Uh, there's not a specific brand that is better than the others. It's the ones that give you the most comfort. And I believe this will be the last question. And um, I apologize if I missed anything. We've, we got so many great questions. It's been fun. Um, but just, I think more to tie it up, you know, um, asking in general what someone can do if they don't feel like they're sleeping well. I mean, what's a good follow-up for someone on this call that maybe has follow-up questions or, you know, what's the best next step? 
Yeah, it's a it's kind of a broad question, and it would include a whole variety of things, many of which we've we've, we've touched on. Um, again, I think the most important thing, the most important slide is the sleep hygiene slide. If you're not sleeping well, and again, you can go on online and you know Google sleep hygiene, you'll get like 12 million hits. That is the absolute most important part. If you're not sleeping well, try to figure out why. And usually if you look at those principles, you'll get some clue. The hard part again is getting people to change habits. It's like, well, I know, but I always watch you know the late show before I go to bed. And, I have to look at Facebook when I wake up at three in the morning and my husband goes to work at five in the morning. I got to get up and the kids don't go to bed till 10. And, and so these lifestyle habits are, you know, really something to look at. Change is hard. Change is hard for all of us. But again, the first step with any sleep complaint is the sleep hygiene. Pick the low lying fruit. Wonderful. Well, I know you're not looking at them, but you've gotten a lot of nice compliments about how much people enjoyed this talk tonight and your humor and keeping it interesting. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us tonight. For anyone that wants a review on this talk, we will have it recorded and available on our YouTube channel. It's also on our Facebook channel. And we'll uh, see everyone back here next month. Thank you, Dr. Trudell. Thank you. And thanks for everybody's attention. I, I can't see all of you, but thank you so much and, and have a great evening. Have a great night.